I love this proverb. It's Proverbs 22, 9. For he who is generous will be blessed. Generosity equals the blessing of God. So we're going to talk about something that only 5% of the church in America does. Tithe. Only 5% of American churchgoers actually tithe. 5%. If, if we had even 50%, churches in America would have enough money that they could do so much more for people. Orphans. Widows. It's a sobering number. I read that. This, was it this morning or last night? I saw that stat. It's an official stat. 5%. And those who do tithe, most only tithe 2%. You know, tithe actually means 10th, so don't call it your 2% a tithe. It's not a tithe. It's 2%. A tithe is 10th. Whoa, here we go. Chris is into it. Tithing and overall generosity is not meant to decrease you. It's meant to increase you. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. When you tithe, it actually does something for you in the natural. It opens up the floodgates of heaven. It's a promise. It's a promise. Give and it shall be given unto you. That's Luke 6, 38, right? Let's read that verse. I have all my verses, most of them written down here on my sheet, which is amazing. Uh, Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured unto you. Give, and it will be given unto who? You. Who's you? So give, and guess what? You'll receive. It's a pretty cool concept. It's very cool. It's a biblical principle. Give, and it will be given unto you. Your giving, or now I'm not, I'm just talking, don't, if you feel conviction, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying this to convict any. I'm just trying to encourage you in generosity and also kind of tell you the state of the church in America today. And I, and I believe this, your giving or lack thereof is a direct reflection of what's in your heart. Now, I have here a couple, uh, three or four uh, different points on tithing, okay? Are you guys okay here? Do you want me to do something fun? Do you want me to make some jokes? Backflips. Back Here's some points on tithing. This should be an encouraging, this is an encouraging message. It's not, like, there's no condemnation in this at all. I just want you to know what the Bible says about, about giving and how... Uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. Jesus literally gave his life. The father gave his son. It's, generosity is a core value of the kingdom. To be generous, not just with finances, but with time. You know, I mean, listen, it's hard. It's hard, especially if, I mean, if you, if you hang out with me or my wife, well, I'll just say me. You know, I got I to gotta tell my, like, my brain, put my phone down. I'm in a conversation. It's, it's hard, man, distractions. It's not, I'm not generous of my time. If we're having a conversation, I'm looking at my phone while you're talking. And, oh, yeah, okay, cool, yeah, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. sweet. Yeah, what, what's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not generosity. I'm, I'm speaking to myself, so, but I don't want, I don't need your judgment next time we're talking and I put my phone out. Oh, Chris, you said that, No. You know, I didn't ask for you to be my accountability partner. <laughs> All right. Number one. Tithing predates the Mosaic Law. So for all of those new covenant people, which we are, but I have a lot of preacher friends who say tithing is not New Testament, it's not New Covenant. Tithing predates that law, Jack. It's before the law. The tithing was in the Mosaic Law, but then... Listen, the first tithe, you know who the first tithe was? Abraham to Melchizedek. Some actually say it was Melchizedek to Abraham, actually. But anyway, Abraham, he uh, went off to battle, and he shows up to Melchizedek, king of Salem, Oregon. And, and the Bible says he has all this spoil, and the, 
Melchizedek was not just a king, he was a high priest. He was a type and shadow of Jesus. Jesus is our, is our king our high, and our high priest. And so the Bible says Abram gave him a tenth. This is four of his spoils. Actually, you know what, what's cool? He gave him a tenth of his spoils after Melchizedek blessed him. Melchizedek blessed him as king. And then he says, I'm going to give you a, a, a tenth, a tithe, a tenth of my spoils. This was f- at least 400 years before the Ma- Mosaic Law. 400 years at least before, the, maybe, maybe 600, four, between four and 600. Okay. Number two. So what was the first one? Babam. Tithing predates the law. So if you say, well, we're out of, we're, you know, Jesus fulfilled the law, that's true. But tithing was before the law. Tithing, number two. Anybody writing this down? Are you writing it down? Anybody else? Are you writing? Deanna, of course, Deanna's writing it down. She's going to write a book about it afterwards. Number two, tithing is, is a reaction to blessing. Like I just said, Abraham, he goes to war. He comes before the king and the high priest, and the high priest and the king blesses him. And because of that, Abram goes, I'm going to give you a tenth. It's a reaction to blessing. You cannot sit here, to say, sit here today and say that God has not blessed you. It's impossible. He has blessed you so much, it, you should, we should be giving like 100%. I mean, he's blessed us so much. This is, he, like, he cannot help but bless you. When we were uh, in my uh, training, we did the worship training in New York, and I, then I did a breakout session, and we were talking about song lyrics, and I said, there's a song that I, I like the song, it's a great song, and I'm not going to come against the song, because I'd love to have written it and, and ca- be cashing those, those royalty checks, but it, I didn't write it, and I'm not cashing those checks. By the way, uh, Chris Ritchie, Music, uh, Spotify. That'd be great. There's some really great songs on there, guys. Sadie's on it. She's, she's killing it on Sound of Yahweh. John's playing the electric guitar. I was going to get to John, his wife's thing. Point to John. John played the electric guitar. Jelena's on it. Uh, In This City. Paige is on it. Um, so thank you for the golf cap clip. Um, what was I saying? The blessing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a song that we we don't really do much, but there's a line in it that goes, "I'm not here for blessing." Okay, well, I got news for you. I'm here for blessing. I understand the heart of the song. I, I really do, and I and I think it. I, I get it, but like I would be so irritated if I'm trying to bless my kids and my kid goes, "Nah, Dad, I don't want it. I don't know." What do you mean? Do you know that hurts the heart of the father? You want to bless me? I'm going to take it. You cannot help but bless, you, bless your kids, God. It's who he is. And one of the reactions we have to the blessing of God biblically is what Abram did. It's before he was Abraham. So I'm Abram. Is he out of the, out of the blessing of God, he turned around and tithed. The 10%. So number two is tithing is a reaction to blessing. I mean, the truth is, the the money that we get is not ours anyway. Like, it's it's his. And and, and, and the tithe is not really about him. It's about you. He doesn't need your 10%. It's about you. You give and you will receive. So that's number two. All right. Number three, God loves a cheerful giver. Who's laughing? Let's read that. It's 2 Corinthians 9. All right, let me find it here. I did not uh, write this one down. Okay, 2 Corinthians 9. You guys can go to it if you want. I got to find it here. Okay. I don't have my glasses here. Yes. Oh, you are on it. Thank you very much. I'll do this one here. Now that it's you. 
Okay. I'm still believing God for a miracle for my high side here. All right, so, are you guys with me? Second Corinthians 9, verse 6. Now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Well, there's also a pretty good principle. Uh, if you sow sparingly, guess what? You re- if, a, if, a, if a farmer only puts down five seed, seeds, five little seeds, he's only getting five crop. The more seed, the more crop. Do you understand the concept of this? Okay. All right. And verse 7. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. That's why we do not demand the tithe. We do not manipulate you with pictures of, you know, homeless people. And I mean, the people, sometimes evangelists have done that. You know, you go to this meeting and the evangelist goes, oh, please give to our ministry and we're going to help all these people. I have no idea if they're helping those people. That is actually a type of manipulation. How about the evangelist that goes, if you give $1,000 to our ministry, God will bless you. It had to be $1,000. I mean, I've seen these. They still do it on TV. Like if, that's, that's, not, that's manipulation. That's, that's you giving under compulsion. Is that the word? Compulsion. I don't know if that's actually the word, but that's manipulation. It says, for God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So I would say this, uh, you can still, you should still tithe and give offerings and be generous, even begrudgingly. That's okay because the principle is still the principle. You tithe, you sow, you will reap. But God says, I actually prefer it if you would do it cheerfully, not begrudgingly. Oh, here we go. We got to tithe again. Great. I just gave whatever. I just spent $100 at Chick-fil-A. Well, maybe don't, maybe go to, well, there's not much you can go to nowadays anyway, but Del Taco, they still have $5 meals. Gross. Here we go. I got to tithe again. Oh, there's not, oh, Carly's up there and John's up there asking for a tithe again. Don't, then guess what? Don't give. I mean, the principle is the same. You can give and you should give, but you know what? Don't give. Because he wants you to give cheerfully. You know why? Why cheerfully? Because you know by giving this, you know I'm going to get. You, see, we, see, we have the, a bad teaching. There's some bad teachings like don't, don't, don't give to receive, just give out of the abundance of your heart. Well, that's true too, because everything you should do should be centered around love or it's a clanging symbol. But a a dumb farmer only plants seed not thinking he's going to get a harvest. That's a dumb farmer. He won't be farming very long. So when you, you can have confidence in, hey, when we tithe and when we give offerings or whatever, I'm very excited about it because I know, A, I am blessing the body of Christ, A, but I'm also putting a seed in that I will have, at some point, that thing will grow into a tree and I will get to eat of its fruit. It's a biblical principle. So that's, that's number, what number was that? Three. All right. Also, let me just say this in general about our finances, just your finances in general. You know, we tend to believe as a, as a church, we, as a body of Christ, we tend to believe uh, God for the miraculous when it comes to healing and things like that. But we, we seem to be lacking when we b- believing God for the miraculous and the supernatural in finances for some reason. We just, it's like this, this thing where, well, you know, healing is more important, you know, than, well, you know, it's, it's pretty important to put bread on your table for your kids. That's pretty important. So, so uh, let me just encourage you. We started doing it uh, in our family, my wife and I. Speak life over your finances. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So if I'm constantly saying I don't have, I can't afford it, then guess what? I'm not going to afford it. Yeah. And the truth is I might not be able to afford it at this minute. But, it's, it, but instead of ending with I can't afford it, I can't afford it at this moment, but I know that God is, is not just provider, but he provides more than enough. And I am going to partner with God for wisdom on how I can afford that. 
See, co-laboring with God in finances also looks like you getting off your butt and actually doing something. That's another principle. Go get a job. If you can't find a job, can't find work, come work at the church. On Every Saturday you can come work and you can clean the church. And God will reward that. He'll see that. He'll reward that. Okay. So speak life over your finances. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You will eat the fruit of what you speak. Psalm 27, 13, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I speak life over my finances and I believe that I will see it because I live in the land of the living, not the land of the dead. It's so good. All right. The Pharisees and religious leaders traveled with Jesus many times. They were traveling with him because they were trying to, they were trying to, you know, mess him up, trying to find him, trying to trick him into something. And they saw, I mean, he literally did miracles, signs, wonders. He loved people. He helped people. I mean, all of it. He did it all. And the Pharisees were there, but because they didn't believe it, they didn't see it. Even it was right there. So you have to believe it to see it. What you believe will manifest. This is not new age. This is kingdom. What you speak either produces life or death. Your God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. So let's change the way we talk about our finances, right? Amen. All right. Tithing, and this is my favorite one. And then why it's going to come up. This is my favorite, number four. Are you writing this down, Vicki? Oh, okay. That's all good. You are? Look at you. Number four, and I'm my favorite. Tithing and generosity open the floodgates of heaven over your finances. It opens it up. Let's go to Malachi. Malachi, if you're Italian. Malachi, we went to Ital Italia this summer. It was amazing. We want to go back, and we want to never come back. No, that's not true. We do. But now, you know, we went to Italy, and, you know, your, your phones know everything about you. And, and so now they've been sending Carly and I, you know, Instagram. It's just all these villas for, you know, $5 American. You can buy this beautiful villa on the Tuscan countryside. It's, there's no way that's true. But it's like the temptation to just buy an Italian villa and move there and just do nothing. How does that sound? Sounds like a plan. He already does. He already does nothing. <laughs> Malachi. Now, now, I was talking to my dad and some people last night about... about uh, Taking verses out of context, we can do that. We do it as a church. I mean, not as we do it, but Christians do it all the time. We just pick a verse that uh, this works, this is great. And a lot of times, verses can work for situations, but, but I call those um, standalone verses where it, it's a principle that works for you and me currently. But a lot of the Bible was written for a certain people at a certain time, and we can still, uh, the, the principles still work, but they weren't actually like, I'll, I'll, a couple examples here. Um, the gifts and callings are without repentance. So we say, well, if you got a gift, God's never going to take that gift away because the Bible says the gifts and callings are, are without repentance. Well, actually, that would be taking the verse out of context. What do you do with the parable of the talents when, uh, when the owner literally ripped the one talent or the one gift, depending on the translation, away from the one who buried it? You bury your gift, you lose your gift. That is actually the gifts and callings without repentance are actually talking to the, to the nation of Israel. It's not talking to, to, to Chris Ritchie. Now, I can use that if the Lord gives it to me prophetically, but that's, it doesn't actually say that. It's for me. This is another one, Malachi. He's talking to Israel, but this is one that translates 
to you and I. It's one of those verses that you can also use for you and I. Are you ready? It's, it's, one, of those truths, it's one of those truths that translates. So verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. That which, that's for you and me, that's this house. The word there is actually, the, the original word is not food. It's pray. Isn't that interesting? It says, so read it like this. Bring the, I was going to say something about Springfield. I'm not going to say it about Springfield, though. <laughs> Springfield, Ohio, I'm not doing it. I'm not going there. I didn't. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. This, anyway, uh, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be prey. That's what it means. You know what that speaks to me? That I'm giving you, you bring the tithe, and I'm giving you the ability to go get stuff. I'm going to bring it to you, and I'm going to give you the ability to go get it. Doors open. Doors of finances for you open. I thought that was exciting. Nobody else did. It's fine. It says, test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hopes, hosts, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. This is amazing stuff. And what's the common thing? Bring the tithe to the storehouse. And I will bless you. Now, this is old covenant. Do you know how much greater it is in the new covenant? Heaven's already open. And what tra- moving this to the new covenant, it's like I'm going to bless you even more. Even more than you can imagine. Let me just say this to Carly. Come up. There is no curse for, under, for believers. You do not operate under a curse. So reject the teaching that says if you don't tithe, you're under a curse. That is old covenant. That is not new covenant. You are not cursed because God does not curse his sons and daughters. But I will tell you this. If you want to walk in the provision and the overflow and the promises that I've just laid out for you, you will begin with the tithe. And we, we're an example. We're not, I'm not going to stand up here and say, tithe if we don't tithe. We, we tithe. And we give offering. We give, up, up, you know, that's just us, the Lord. You don't, have to, you don't have to give up above the tithe. But it does say tithes and offerings. Uh, so, but start with the tithe. I'm telling you guys, God is either a liar <clears throat> or he's not. And, and you, you got to be able to trust what he says in here. Okay, so that's my little tithe message. Um, Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you're encouraged. Were you encouraged? Hopefully you feel encouraged, not discouraged. Don't feel condemned. Reject condemnation. There's no condom. You say, well, I haven't tithed in 10 years. Don't worry about it. Start today. Don't worry about it. Start today. There's grace for you. There's grace for you. And as David says, I've never seen the righteous beg for bread. It's not in God's, it's not in God's nature to have his sons and daughters begging for him. In fact, he despises it when we beg. Okay, my wife has some really cool stuff here. Okay. Well, my official capacity at church is that I'm the executive pastor. This is really ringing yeah, today. It's ringing, yeah. So my day-to-day uh, tasks are very administrative in nature. And a number of years ago, I said, if I take on this role as the administrator, I don't want to be this naggy bossy, not led by the spirit, administrator. Because sometimes we can get lost in the weeds, and I don't want to do that. But today, I do want to have a conversation with you just about where your money goes, because you should know, right? So I'm going to, yeah, when you give to the church, you should know where you're, where it goes. So I'm going to wear my administrator hat, if that's okay, for a few minutes. Well, firstly, I want to let you know that overall, our monthly budget is right around $40,000. So it takes the church to function in every practical way about $40,000 every month, okay? 
And that $40,000 gets broken down into a few categories. Uh, firstly, um, missionaries and missions. We all know the verse in Genesis 12 that says um, that God will bless all of those who bless Israel. Amen? So as a church, we, on the first of every month, it's the first thing that happens every month, we give to an organization called One for Israel. And um, this is an organization that com is comprised of Jews and Arabs who know Jesus and who are sharing the gospel with not just Israel, but the world. They were founded in 1990 as a Bible school in Israel, and they have expanded to include evangelism training, discipleship, a soldier's ministry where they uh, minister specifically to the IDF, um, a, a women in leadership program, Arabic outreach, and humanitarian aid. So that is an organization that we give to every month. We believe in it. We're behind them. Um, it is a privilege to support them as they bless Israel. Amen? Um, we also give to a number of other ministries. We give to Harold Eberly and his ministry, Worldcast. We give to Larry Titus and his ministry, Kingdom Global. Uh, we give to Tony Robinson and her ministry, Daughters of the Well. We also give to Pastor Zach uh, just as an honoring, uh, as the founding pastor of our church and our movement. Um, and those are all things that are very important to us, and we do them right off the top. Oh, yeah, and we give, we give to Gershom and uh, the ministry, His Presence Fire. Um, and you can, they do. We, when I say we, I mean we, not Chris and I. <laughs> We, as a church. So we give to missionaries. Um, the next item on our list, I believe, is outreach and helps. You know about the outreach team that goes out once a month. Um, also included in that helps ministry is just regular benevolence. If there's people in our community who um, that we are aware of who need help with bills or medical expenses, um, putting food on their table, uh, when we hear about it and you're a part of our house, if we're able to, we like to step in. We also uh, have given uh, many thousands of dollars to churches in our community here in Vegas who are either going through a hard time or who are um, in the process of building. We love to sow into building funds, amen, and see them accomplish the goal and the vision that God has put in front of them. So we like to come alongside of them and support them. Okay, so the next item, as you can see, is rent and payroll and bills. Um, we do not own this facility. We lease it. We've been here for 10 years. And um, in old Celtic Christian circles, they referred to places as thin places. We talked about it in our Wednesday night class a couple of weeks ago. And a thin place is where the distance between heaven and earth collapses. And I like to think of Encounter Church, us as a people, but also physically our building as a place where heaven and earth collide. And I cannot tell you over the years how many people who have nothing to do with our church and don't even profess to know Jesus have walked through those doors into this sanctuary and they stop and they go, whoa, there's something different here. So yes, we are the church, the body, the people, right? But there's something profound about this space that we have occupied for 10 years. And just because we don't own it, it doesn't mean that we haven't tilled the ground and sown. And there's a deep well here. So much so that even people who don't know Jesus, when they walk in, they experience it. HVAC guys, the owner of the complex when he visited two years ago, um, the, the guy who comes to check the fire extinguishers. I encounter these people pretty regularly, and when they step into our building physically, they recognize that there's a difference. So um, I, don't want, I don't want us to despise the fact that we don't tangibly own this place, because we do own this place, OK? So payroll, we have nine employees here at Encounter Church. We have two full-time and seven part-time. And most of our part-time are quarter-time, if that makes sense. Like they're below part-time. Um, but they serve and they have a job description and they carry out duties weekly so that as a church, we function. We are not identified as our function 
or our title. Yes, I'm the executive pastor, but before any of that, I'm a daughter of the king. And that is my role primarily. And all of our employees, even though they wear a title, they function as a son or daughter of God. But we want you to know that there is payroll. Amen? Then we have regular things like bills that include things like paying for the Wi-Fi so that we can stream our services, paying for the air conditioning so that it's not too hot in here on a Sunday morning. Things, very practical things. They're not holy, but they are holy, okay? We pay for janitorial supplies. We staff the cat, or we, uh, well, staff, but we purchase stock. That's the word. The cafe, we purchase things so that our kids' ministry has the tangible things that make those classrooms run, um, ministry supplies and all of that. So there's there are practical things. I think sometimes we come to church, and it is this beautiful, holy, spiritual experience with God, but there are real practical sides to having a building and making everything work, okay? Um, and lastly, oh, that is lastly. All right, yeah, those are my, those are my items. So all of those are, are they're a pretty uh, broad breakdown, but they are a breakdown of where your money goes every month, okay? Perfect, you did an amazing job for you. Yes, they clapped for you. They didn't clap for me when I was done, but they clapped for you, so that's good. I just wanna say this too, uh, we're getting to the, real quick, we're almost done. Um, is changing the way we think about generosity and, and giving. Uh, think of it less as a transactional thing. Well, I'm giving to the church. and No, think of it more as I am in financial covenant partner with God. And my portion is generosity and his portion is absolute, unbelievable abundance. Okay. Um, all right. So real quickly, Gwen, we're going to put up the next slide. It says mission. This is our mission. Some of you don't know. Now you know. Our mission is this. To see personal, regional, and global expansion of God's kingdom through his manifest presence. How we do that, you're, we're doing it right now. This is We want to see the kingdom of God expanded regionally and globally. And it's, you know, we have encounter churches all over the uh, North, North America and, uh, yeah, North America. So uh, we see that expanding uh, at some point. So that's going to be, that's, that's our mission. Okay, our next one is our vision. Okay, here's our vision. So we want to, without vision, people perish, right? So our vision, there's a few, a few things. Is we want to have a $1 million budget to help facilitate the, the mission and more. We're believing for $100 million a year as, as a, just as our budget and, and going up from there. Then we can do all kinds of amazing things in the community, to the community, um, and just helping expand the gospel, right? All right, next one. We want to have a new building within three to five years. Come on. <laughs> like we don't own, she said we own this, but she meant we own it as a people. We don't own this building. We pay rent and it's not cheap. We are in a prime spot and we're so glad and we're so grateful that we're here. Um, but we'd like to own our own building and we have a three to five year plan to do that. Uh, so we don't know where, where, but in this area we'd like to buy and own. All right. Next one, we would like to have, my wife doesn't, but we're in agreement. We want to have, to start, we want to have a school K through five school, K, kindergarten through fifth grade to start with. Um, private Christian school, good education. We're going to teach the kingdom of heaven, the manifest presence of God, and of course, math and science and all that boring stuff. We'll take care of that too. But so you can have a, a place that's not super expensive to come and drop your kids off and they can get a, a great, I will not be a teacher of that, that at all. <laughs> will you teach? Oh, maybe. Wow. So that's, hopefully we want to see that in the next a few years. Okay, next one. We want to have a studio. Of course, I want a studio for film. <laughs> Music and creative arts. I want to have our own studio. We can, we can produce movies and records, and we can rent it out to people that want to produce their own movies and, and records, and we want to have a podcast studio. Some of these things we can, we can like podcast studio, we could kind of make room for it right now, but uh, the vision is to have a separate studio for releasing people to do creative arts and, and so that's going to be great. I mean, I'm going to have my own personal studio, 
but I'd also like a church studio. All right, next one. We want to run a school for creative arts and a school of ministry. Um, this would be, you know, uh, probably a year-long school uh, for, the, for the ministry. In fact, that's something that we could probably start fairly soon. I know my dad ran a school of ministry in Hawaii for many years called Revival School of Hawaii, I think. Oh, excuse me, Hawaii Revival School of Ministry. Pretty close. And so we have, uh, I know he could do it right now, but we definitely want to do a school of, who's, who's interested in a school of ministry? Getting like a, getting like a, a, cert, a certificate to preach and pastor. Okay, we have, so we have about four students right now. Um, um, and then a school of creative arts. So this would be for film and television and painting and acting and writing, you know, books and scripts and all dance and all that stuff. School of Creative Arts, a one-year school of anybody interested in a school of creative arts. So that we have about three students there. We can get rolling with that. But anyway, um, so this is our vision. We wanted to cast vision today. So you you now have caught it, and you can run with us, and you can pray into those these things. One million dollar budget, new building within three to five years, K through five Christian private school. Eventually, I want that to go to K through eight, uh, and it could have been K through eight to start studio studio for film and a school. So this is the vision of Encounter Church and of our house. So I'm very excited about what the next few years are going to bring. We're committed to seeing God do what he wants to do in this house. A core value is always going to be the presence of God. We do not gather around the pulpit. We gather around the presence. We're not a pulpit-driven church, although we've preached tonight, today, for about 45 minutes. It's, not, it's unusual, but we wanted to talk to you about these things. Uh, but we are a presence-driven church. It's who we are. Sundays are about the presence of God. Wednesdays are about equipping the saints. Come Wednesdays, it's called Equip Wednesdays. That's when we equip you. We equip you, all right?